it's a different tune. I'm going through the big D and don't mean Dallas. I can't believe what the judge had to tell us. I got the Jeep, she got the palace. I'm going through the big D and don't mean Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Brian Duncan. I'm the president-elect of SAGES, and I have the honor of kicking off this session this morning. So SAGES is a society whose leaders get to be leaders by doing lots of hard work. You roll up your sleeves, you dive in, and you get the work done. Dr. L. Michael Brunt, has some pretty long sleeves. He's been rolling them up for 23 years for this society in almost every facet uh, of leadership. He started with something we call the Sage's Grand Rounds. He then moved on to Program Committee and then Finance Committee, our first bandit in that role. Actually, it was a pretty good year financially. Next was Educational Resources, followed by the uh, continuing Educational Committee, a philosophy he obviously took to heart even in high school. He then took on the role of treasurer in 2010 and helped our society navigate some scary times in the financial market. I know one of Mike's proudest accomplishments was the year he spent writing and directing a video documentary for Dr. George Bursey's life, which debuted at the annual meeting in 2013 and now he's moved on to president as a leadership role in this society. Mike earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Mississippi, attended Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and served his residency at Barnes Hospital and Washington University, where he is now a professor of surgery and director of the MIS Clinical Fellowship Program. His two professional loves are clinical outcome studies and minimally invasive surgery, and education and training of medical students and surgical residents as seen here in this slide. His clinical work includes laparoscopic adrenal surgery and complex hernia surgery. He's an extraordinary hard-working uh, physician, unafraid to take risks. Sometimes those risks lead to setbacks and a fall as seen here in Salt Lake City last year. But he knows how to bounce back, as he did later this day, self-medicate a bit, and ultimately reach his goal. But Mike has other loves in his life. The first is his wife of 32 years, Beth, a surgical pathologist with specialization in liver pathology. She is section head of liver pathology and uh, GI pathology at Washington University. There's his eldest son, Eric, daughter-in-law, Lindsay, younger son, Timothy, and Timothy's fiance and soon-to-be wife, Stephanie. Most recently, there is a new love in Mike's life that keeps him perpetually smiling, his granddaughter, Avery. In preparing for this uh, opening, I asked members of the executive committee to describe Mike Brunt, uh, and they used these words, deliberate, thoughtful, man of integrity, genuinely nice person, focused, driven, musical, thoughtful, a calming, deliberate, and comforting force. One said, he's Clark Kent. This mild-mannered, intellectual gentleman leader puts on sunglasses, holds a mic, and transforms into a rock star. Personally, Mike has taught me about leadership. He's enthusiastic and driven, but never lets that cloud his judgment. Ask him a difficult question, and he will pause a beat, ponder, and then respond in a thoughtful, intellectual, uh, and respectful manner with diplomacy. He has guided the society over the last year masterfully and has been an honor to serve at his side. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Brunt, your SAGES president.
That's the last music you'll hear from me until tonight. <laughs> Brian, thank you for that um, very kind and generous uh, introduction. It's um, been an absolute incredible pr pleasure to work with all the exec, but in particular with Brian this year. Uh, we've become great friends, and you have a very a clear vision about uh, the things that you want to accomplish in the coming years, and I know that the organization is in great hands under your leadership this coming year, so thank you so much. Um, Mom, I'm, I'm sorry you had to see that picture of me on the backboard. Um, that was, uh, but it was okay. There were a lot of surgeons out on the slopes that day. Um, this uh, was actually um, the Monday, uh, the Sunday right before the Sages meeting started that uh, I unadvisably went skiing. And uh, my greatest fear as I was uh, uh, being uh, skied uh, on that sled down the mountains is that I might not be, be able to attend Dan Jones' special FUSE task force meeting the following day. So, um, but seriously though, uh, I appreciate Brian Duncan and Val Halpin uh, trekking back up the, the slopes to come attend to me and, and all that you have done. This is my disclosure slide, none of which relates to this talk. The last time Sages met in Nashville was in 1994, in this same venue, in fact. The Sages president was George Bercy, and so it's a special privilege to be standing here where Dr. Bercy gave his address 21 years ago, almost to the day. Moreover, when I consider the icons of mentally invasive surgery and fathers of the laparoscopic revolution who've been in this position, I'm indeed humbled and incredibly honored to have had the opportunity to serve as your SAGES president this past year. I was a relative newcomer to SAGES in 1994, having joined the society two years prior in 1992 at the urging of Nat Soper. 1992 was also my first SAGES meeting in Washington, D.C., and it was a meeting I will never forget. The energy and excitement were literally palpable because the laparoscopic revolution was in underway in full force, and it seemed almost every week brought some new technology or technique to clinical practice. Sages was, of course, leading that revolution, and as I reflect back, it's amazing to see the evolution of our society to one that has impacted education and training, research and innovation in virtually every aspect of GI and endoscopic surgery. That meeting, coincidentally and perhaps propitiously for me, was also the debut of the lap wrappers and the precursor to the Friday main event that has become a signature feature of every SAGES meeting. But it was only three years prior to that 1992 meeting that SAGES was in reality something of a backwater society, a society of visionary surgeons who were committed to performing flexible endoscopy and surgical practice. I'd like to examine a bit of the pathway that allowed SAGES to evolve as it did highlight some of our important current initiatives, and then end with a few personal reflections. Let me begin by reviewing with you what I consider to be three of the sentinel events in the life of SAGES. And I'd like to first acknowledge a number of individuals who uh, I interviewed and who helped provide material for this portion of my talk. In 1989, the SAGES meeting was in, held in April in Louisville, Kentucky. About six weeks before the meeting, Barbara Bercy received a call from Jacques Parasat, who told her he had a video of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy that he would like to show. There was some confusion at first. Cholecystostomy, you mean, she said. No, cholecystectomy, he replied. The program was full, but Barbara called Wayne Schwesinger, the program chair for the meeting, and told him they had to find a spot for this. So Professor Parasat was given a slot in the exhibit hall to show his video. An announcement was put into the meeting packet of a special video presentation during one of the breaks. This story, by the way, was retold at the 2009 meeting, and you can read Professor Parasat's description about it in Surgical Endoscopy. At that SAGES meeting, there were about 210 attendees, and perhaps 60, of 70 of, 60 to 70 of these showed up to watch the Lap Coley video. The exhibit hall in 1989 was a shadow of itself, with only about 20 exhibitors total. The impact and importance of Professor Parasat's video was immediately apparent to the SAGES leaders there. It was described as visually striking, a tremendous awakening, amazing. But what came next was crucial. Several of the SAGES leaders convened afterwards and said, we can't leave this meeting without discussing what this means. 
they recognized that something significant had happened, that it was a disruptive technology, and they knew they had to act on it. It was a never a question of whether, but of how. So why did SAGE's leaders decide to move on this? One was concerned that gastroenterologists might consider doing this since some were already doing diagnostic laparoscopy and SAGE's had already been engaged with them over the flexible endoscopy issues and realized what could be at stake. Second, these surgeons were accustomed to doing procedures using an endoscope. So the translation to the laparoscope with the effects of magnification and improved visualization made sense. And third, what other surgical society was going to step up and take on this issue? Sages quickly put together a position statement crafted by Ken Ford and others and published in Surgical Endoscopy and in the Bulletin of the American College of Surgeons stating that only someone who did open cholecystectomy should do it laparoscopically. Things moved rapidly from there. Within less than one year of this video being shown at the meeting, the first guideline on lap coli came out from Sages. George Bercy and Alfred Cuchieri collaborated on a book entitled Laparoscopic Biliary Surgery, which was published in 1990 and sold over 25,000 copies in multiple languages. The first Lap Coley postgraduate course was held at the 1990 meeting in Atlanta, and over the next year, the SAGE's office was bombarded with up to 100 calls per week from surgeons asking about courses for cholecystectomy. There were one-day courses popping up all over that were highly variable. And so SAGES developed a series of train-the-trainer courses so that surgeons at academic and training institutions would be able to teach laparoscopy to their trainees and other surgeons. In doing this, SAGES helped provide some formal structure to the courses that were being taught. Not only did SAGES help in the training for lap coli, but to quote Jeff Ponsky, SAGES learned how to lead an entire nation and world in the laparoscopic revolution. And it was with lap coli that the whole concept of proctoring was born. At the 1990 meeting in Atlanta, attendance had more than doubled to 450. And at Monterey in 1991, it was 775, with many more who called SAGES and begged to get into the meeting and the laparoscopic hands-on courses. And the growth of the annual meeting continued at an almost exponential rate through the 1990s until the 2000 mark was reached first in 2002, then again in 2007, a level at which we have stayed ever since. Between 1990 and 1992, <clears throat> about 15,000 general surgeons in the U.S. were trained in this procedure. SAGES needed faculty for the 22 train the trainer courses in the first year. And there were more young surgeons who had been in some of these courses. And so unlike the traditional surgical paradigm where you teach courses when you're mid-career or later, these train the trainer courses were largely taught by the young surgeons, such as Nat Soper, John Hunter, Lee Swanstrom, Jonathan Sackier, Joe Peetland and many others. Why did they get involved? According to Nat Soper, SAGES was this radical breakaway society, and this was another breakthrough technology. You couldn't get an abstract on Lap Coley on at a mainstream meeting, and SAGES was willing to let young people come in and do things and get involved in teaching. He said, it's hard to appreciate today how much against the grain this went. These young surgeons were trained in flexible endoscopy and were doing biliary surgery already, and so they readily embraced laparoscopy and put together clinical outcome studies to address some of the key questions early on. The association that some had with major academic institutions also helped establish credibility to the movement. And they also established a new pathway to building an academic career, and out of this, a new generation of SAGES leaders emerged, several of whom went on to become president of this organization. Despite the obvious advantages and excitement that accompanied the laparoscopic revolution, there was a problem, and that was the increase in the rate of biliary injuries. In New York, the presence of biliary and other serious injuries almost led the state to put a moratorium on this procedure. Fortunately, that did not happen, thanks to the efforts of Ken Ford and Rick Green, who was SAGE's president then. But unfortunately, despite a quarter century of surgeons performing lap coli, the problem of biliary injury has not gone away a problem to which I will return. A second sentinel event in the life of SAGES was the formation of the SAGES Education and Research Foundation in 1999. The birth of the SAGES Foundation was due to the vision of SAGES leaders, Greg Stiegman, Ken Ford, Jeff Ponsky, Barbara Bercy, and others, who saw the need for an organization separate from SAGES in which the strategy was long-term. They recognized even then that the days of abundant support from industry would not last forever and they saw the need well before the heightened awareness regarding conflict of, of interest issues 
that a corpus of dollars that could be used to independently fund projects would be in the best interests of GI and endoscopic surgery, patient care, and surgical education over the long term. They held a strategic planning meeting in New York City and went about raising the funds to set this in motion. The corpus was started with incredibly generous donations from industry, and the founders also put their money where their mouth was, with each foundation board member committing to donating $5,000 over time. The foundation has been ably led by former SAGES presidents Greg Stiegman, Rick Green, Bruce Shermer, and now Desmond Burkett, who takes over as president of the foundation as of this meeting. The foundation is a big part of the success of our organization and has provided critical support to numerous projects and programs over the years. FLS, FES, FUSE, the Global Program, Career Development Award, the Brandeis Award, numerous research grants, and other projects. SAGES has regularly contributed funds to the foundation and also matches member contributions annually with over 1.6 million total given to the foundation. But we've received more in return. For every dollar SAGES has given to the foundation, SAGES has received back over one and a half dollars to fund SAGES education and research projects, over 2.5 million total. Many SAGES members have given generously to the foundation, most notably Dr. Pond, whose recent philanthropic gift will support life-changing advances in laparoscopic surgery in the developing world. But we can and must do more. The foundation needs greater support by our active membership. I regret to say that of the over 3,700 active members of our organization, the annual, annual contribution rate is under 10%. We can do a lot better. Let me tell you a brief story from one of our SAGES members, Rob Lim. Rob's been a leader of our military working group for the last several years. Earlier this week, he received the Gold Foundation supported SAGES Clinical Excellence and Humanism in Medicine Award. Rob was unable to accept this award in person as he was recently deployed to Afghanistan for six months. Instead, he's requested that the $1,000 honorarium for his award be donated to the SAGES Foundation. He said very simply, the donation is the least I could do for SAGES after all it has done for my career and professional development. So let me charge each of you to make the foundation a top priority for your charitable giving every year. No gift is too small. The important thing is to become a donor at any level. Join the SAGES World Campaign the foundation has initiated this year to extend the SAGES global contributions to education, research, and training. The foundation is a part of the SAGES brand and it's up to us to support it and help expand the reach of our organization. A third sentinel event for SAGES was a decision made very early in the life of our society. And that was the decision in 1984 to hire Barbara Saltzman, who of course later became Barbara Bercy to manage SAGES. SAGES had been managed by a PR firm, but needed someone who could do more administrative and secretarial work. Jerry Marks had known Barbara, who lived in Philadelphia at the time, and it was he who proposed the idea to her. Tom Dent and Ken Ford interviewed her and made the decision. They described her as smart and a quick learner, highly energetic, articulate, and persuasive. She took care of things in a business-like fashion and was organized and perceptive. She understood this was an opportunity to facilitate something new, to work with a group of young, idealistic surgeons who were not in the traditional mold, and was also an opportunity for her to develop an organization and grow as well. She learned about what SAGES was engaged in from a surgical standpoint and was willing to ask questions. She understood the people and the potential for the growth of the society. She was persistent, always working to do the right thing and hard to say no to, especially when she said, you have to do this now. She had great strength and was devoted in a way that few were devoted. Surgeons looked up to her as a vo voice of conscience within the organization. It was a different and unique relationship. To quote one SAGES leader, SAGES is what it is today in part because of her exemplary vision and remarkable dedication. SAGES soon became family for her, not just as a SAGES mother, which of course she is and always will be, but as she and George Bercy married in 1989 and she and BSC moved to LA. Initially, Barbara managed SAGES by herself, but as the organization grew, she hired some part-time staff and then gradually some full-time employees. And in 1993, 
a young woman walked into Barbara's office looking for temporary employment as a secretary while she pursued a musical career as a singer. Her only stipulation was that if she were called for an audition, she could get off work to go do that. Fortunately for Sages, the musical career did not work out and Sally Matthews quickly took on more and more responsibilities within Sages. Like Barbara, she's very bright and clearly had a lot of talent when it came to managing an organization and a group of surgeons. In 1998, Sally became executive director of Sages and in 2008, president and CEO of BSC. And Barbara has, of course, continued to be involved in Sages and the foundation. BSC now has over 50 employees and manages 18 societies, but the personal attention that we get makes it seem we're the only one. As anyone who's been in this position would tell you, I can't imagine leading this society without Sally at the helm. Together, Barbara and Sally have given our organization continuity of management for more than 30 years and collectively have a phenomenal institutional memory about SAGES and all its operations and activities. But perhaps most importantly, and what sets aside this relationship from any other society and management group I've been a part of, is how spiritually and intellectually invested they are with us and our mission. They are a part of the very fabric of our organization, and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. And so I'd like to ask Barbara, Sally, and the entire BSC staff to stand and be recognized for all your work and contributions on behalf of our organization. Let me now turn to the present and spend a few moments highlighting some of SAGE's recent efforts. This year we reached a milestone as we celebrated 10 years of the FLS program, a story that was featured in the Bulletin of the American College of Surgeons last fall, another incredible SAGE's undertaking and story in and of itself. And SAGE's awarded the 10,000th FLS certificate to Chris Crawford, a general surgery resident at the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin. FES also went live last year and will be required of all graduating general surgery residents in the U.S. as of 2018. It's been 15 years now since To Air as Human brought to attention the problem of potentially preventable hospital-related injuries and death. SAGES has undoubtedly impacted this area in terms of our many education and training programs, but we can do more. Indeed, a goal of this presidential year for me has been to enhance awareness and efforts of our society around patient safety. Aurora Pryor and Michael Holtzman have put on a fabulous meeting with the theme of promoting a universal culture of innovation safety and improved outcomes in GI surgery. I hope you've noticed throughout the program the band-aids labeling various sessions and talks that relate to patient safety issues. We also have a phenomenal opportunity right before us with the FUSE program. The brainchild of Steve Schweitzberg, in just four years, this program has gone from concept to reality under the leadership of Dan Jones, Leanne Felbin, Pascal Fuchsuber, and Tom Robinson. Fuse went live this past September and has already created tremendous interest across the surgical world. I dare say there's no other area in surgery which so ubiquitously impacts almost everything we do and yet about which surgeons are so lacking in fundamental knowledge and understanding. I certainly did not realize how uninformed I was about surgical energy until I got involved in the FUSE project. Let's take just one example, OR fires. It's estimated that there are 200 to 240 OR fires that occur in the U.S. every year. Not a large number, certainly when you consider the millions of procedures performed annually. And most of these are minor and don't cause any harm, but up to 20 to 30 are serious and result in disfiguring injuries or even death. We have every element needed to start a fire in the OR. Fuel with our drapes and alcohol-based preps, igniters with our electrosurgical equipment, and high-intensity light cords, and oxidizers, oxygen. And it can happen in a flash, literally. A story that I've heard on more than one occasion is a surgeon was taking off a molar cyst on the scalp or face. Oxygen was being given via nasa cannula. The electrosurgical unit was activated and there was a spark and a flash beneath the drapes. And this is the result. This young woman's story was told on the Today Show four years ago, and unfortunately, it's not the last one like it I've heard about since. 
This is a totally preventable problem, event, and it's a top safety priority for the FDA, which has an OR Fire Prevention Week each fall, and with whom SAGES is engaged on, on this issue. It simply requires that we all understand the risk and are vigilant about taking the appropriate precautions. FUSE can make a difference here, I'm convinced. This is our program, and SAGES members need to lead the way. So let me pose a challenge to you, that every surgeon in this audience, allied health personnel too, over the next 12 months become FUSE certified. But not only that, once you're FUSE certified, become an energy safety leader and advocate at your home institution. Give talks about it. Engage your OR leadership. Discuss ways to prevent OR fires and other electrosurgical injuries. This will, I'm convinced, have a major impact on how our operative teams approach energy safety in the OR and a positive patient impact. The second SAGES patient safety initiative goes back to the problem of laparoscopic cholecystectomy and biliary injury. Although it's been 25 years since lap coli was introduced into practice, bile duct injuries continue to occur. Even if the biliary injury rate is only 0.2%, and it may be higher, especially for acutely inflamed gallbladders, that translates to 3,000 or more biliary injuries in the U.S. each year. A bile duct injury can be a devastating outcome for the patient who otherwise would have undergone an outpatient procedure with minimal pain and prompt return to normal activities. And it can also be emotionally devastating for the surgeon. This past year, at my direction, SAGES has formed the Safe Cholecystectomy Task Force led by Rob Finelli and Horacio Asman with a mission to enhance a universal culture of safety for cholecystectomy in an effort to reduce biliary injuries. A multimodal educational program is being developed to address this issue. <clears throat> but there are already things we can do now to move this initiative forward by incorporating these six steps into our practices, which are the cornerstone of the Safe Coley program. Learn about the critical view of safety and use it on every cholecystectomy case. Consider an interoperative timeout. In other words, a brief stop point, a pause, during the procedure before clipping or cutting any ductal structures. Understand aberrant anatomy. Use cholangiography or other methods to image the biliary tree interoperative liberally. Recognize when the dissection is approaching a zone of danger and stop before entering that zone in the difficult case. If conditions around the gallbladder are too unfavorable, put in a cholecystostomy tube or do a subtotal cholecystectomy. And finally, for really difficult cases, consider getting help from another surgeon. Go to the SAGES website and read more about this. Impacting this problem will not be easy because it will require a change in culture about an operation that surgeons know how to do and do well and that the vast majority of time is straightforward and uncomplicated. But if we don't take this on, then this problem will never go away and we will be abdicating our responsibility to our patients to make surgery safer. So I implore you to adopt these measures, spread the word, about the SAGES Safe Coley program. And together, let's start doing something about this problem now. So for the final portion of this address, I'd like to shift gears a bit and share with you a few thoughts and concepts I've gleaned from my perspective of 25 years in surgical practice. First, there are multiple pathways to success. My own pathway to the present has been a bit of a non-linear one. I started out as a general and endocrine surgeon, and although I began doing laparoscopic surgery in 1990, didn't really make that the main focus of my practice until a few years later. I served on some SAGES committees in the 1990s, but I think I first really became noticed when at the sing-off in 2001 at the meeting in St. Louis, I debuted the Scoping Stones and was subsequently drafted into the lap wrappers. Seriously though, when I co-chaired the Continuing Education Committee, Dan Smith gave me the opportunity to produce the SAGES Grand Round series. And although these never quite became the best sellers that I had hoped for, there were two things of significance that did come out of that project. One, it gave us some additional quality materials that helped SAGES connect with and become a member of the SCORE Council. And two, it gave me the experience in filming and video production that was invaluable in producing the Bercy documentary film. So my message to you is to take advantage of the opportunities that come your way in SAGES. A SAGES leader will support you and get you on a committee or involved in a resident course and help push your name along. But much more important is what you make of that opportunity. Because SAGES ultimately 
is a society that functions as a meritocracy and that rewards individuals who volunteer for projects, who are responsive and organized and get the work done to move our society's agenda forward. Two, put yourself back on the learning curve. Some of you are still very much on your learning curve, whether in residency, fellowship, or even the first few years of your practice, but the learning curve in surgery never stops. In his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the factors that differentiate individuals who have achieved not just success, but extraordinary success in their life's work. Although there are many variables, one factor is the 10,000 hour rule. Erickson's work that shows that what differentiates levels of performance Interestingly, his early studies looked at musical performance, is that the people at the top not only work harder, but much, much harder than anyone else. And so that takes me to the Beatles, since this is, after all, a Sage's Magical Mystery Tour. Before the Beatles came to America to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964, they'd been playing together for seven years. They were still a struggling high school rock band when they were invited to Hamburg, Germany in 1960 to perform in the clubs there. It was an unusual arrangement. They played nonstop shows, hour after hour, up to eight hours a day. John Lennon said, in Liverpool, we only played for an hour and just our best numbers, so we had to find a new way of playing. Over the next year and a half, they did three stints in Hamburg, performing over 270 nights and an estimated 1,200 times live. Philip Norman, who wrote the Beatles biography, Shout, said, they were no good on stage when they went there, but they were very good when they came back and they sounded like no one else. It was the making of them. Amazingly, their greatest artistic successes, Sgt. Pepper's Magical Mystery Tour and the White Album came only five years after that return from Hamburg. I think the early days of the laparoscopic revolution were somewhat like that. A generation of young surgeons who had, for the most part, not done any laparoscopic surgery and training. In fact, a survey of SAGE's past presidents from 1995 to the present showed that of the individuals who finished training 1989 or earlier, only one quarter had any experience with laparoscopy before they started doing lap coli. And I'm quite certain that I will be the last SAGE's president who did not do a single laparoscopic case during residency training. So what did they do? Well, they went to the lab, did procedures there. They worked with GYN surgeons at their institution who were doing laparoscopy. They practiced and honed their skills. They learned how to suture. They worked with industry to develop the tools needed to perform more advanced and complex cases and carefully introduced new techniques into surgical practice. Out of this also was born the impetus for the development of formal skills training for re surgical residency, something that did not even exist prior to that time. They were also not willing to limit themselves by the present constraints and considerations of what was possible. Third, don't be so quick to claim your limitations when you've never really tested them. I first saw this quote a few years ago on the message board in the locker room of one of our pro sports teams in St. Louis. Although our hockey team has never quite fulfilled this admonition with playoff success, I've thought about it a lot and it's too easy to get comfortable with your situation oftentimes and not challenge yourself, but you won't ever realize your full potential if you don't push yourself from time to time. My original plan this year was to cut back a bit clinically in order to devote more time to SAGES, but those plans quickly dissolved due to some faculty departures, and this has turned out instead to be the busiest clinical year I've ever had by far, something I could have not managed without a lot of support from my colleagues and staff. But the point is, sometimes you have to reach down inside yourself for that extra gear in order to meet a challenge or to carry you through difficult times. In the movie, A League of Their Own, about a women's professional baseball team during World War II, one of the star players complains to the manager, played by Tom Hanks, that she wants to quit because it's just become too hard. His reply is, of course it's hard. The hard is what makes it so good. Finally, keep the main thing the main thing. A senior surgeon said to me early in my career, take care of your family first and everything else in your career will fall into place. I've been blessed by family in many ways. There's my WashU family in particular, my wonderful partners and colleagues past and present, Brent Matthews, who I learned so much from during his 10 years in St. Louis, 
Chris Eagle, Egan and Michael Awad. My staff, Kim and Mary, who've been such a huge support this year in so many ways and have had to take on more and more responsibilities without once complaining. Peggy Frisella, who keeps our MS, MIS Institute going, and my OR staff, Julie Sly, the rest of the OR team. There's my Sages family. Yes, Sages is really like family. I so, owe so much in my Sages career to so many individuals, but in particular, a special thanks to Nat Soper, who was my colleague at WashU for many years, and who got me involved in Sages and for his continued support. And also to Mark Talamini, Steve Schweitzberg, and Dan DeZeal for their friendship and mentorship over the years. The Sages Executive Committee, who worked so hard and commit their best to leading the society to achieve its goals and aspirations. Sally, it's been so incredible to work so closely with you this year. Your calming influence, incredible knowledge about Sages and organization have been amazing to behold. Then there's my family family. My mom and dad who gave this small town Mississippi boy the opportunity to pursue a dream and encourage me every step of the way and who sacrificed so I could get a good education. Our two wonderful boys, Eric and his wife, Lindsay, and our precious granddaughter, Timothy, and his fiance, Stephanie. I'm so proud of them and the fine young men they've become. And my dear wife, Beth, who is so accomplished in her own right and is not only one of the best liver and GI pathologist in the world, but also a wonderful mother, a loving wife with a kind and caring heart. Her indomitable spirit is an inspiration to me on a daily basis, and I can't thank you enough for all your love and support this year. One of my favorite movies is Field of Dreams. I won't recant the story in detail, but it's about a farmer in Iowa by the name of Ray Kinsella who hears a voice telling him to build a baseball field on his farm, to which Shoeless Joe Jackson and other 1919-era baseball players return from the afterlife to play games. Perhaps it resonates with me because as a kid, I dreamed of playing baseball, but instead became a doctor, like Archie Moonlight Graham in the movie. But also because at the end, Ray's dad, who'd also been a baseball player and had passed away years before, returns to play on this field and they have a game of catch. And as his dad surveys the pristine field in Ray's family, he asks, is this heaven? And Ray says, no, it's Iowa. But then he thinks again. And as he looks around at what he has and says, maybe it is heaven. When I consider the many blessings in my life, my friends and colleagues and family for me, this is a bit of heaven on earth. It's been a great honor to serve as your SAGES president this year. Thank you so much, and God bless. Michael, thank you and for all you've done for the society and for the work that you've done this last year. And in commemoration of that, I'd like to give you a plaque, uh, a quote from Lao Tzu. The quote says, a leader is, is great when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a short break. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a short two-minute break, and then we'll go uh, right into the Mark's lecture, so please don't go anywhere. Thank you.
met you And the way it might have been without you here I don't know if words for me can still upset you Could I ask everyone to please uh, please take a seat so we can uh, uh, proceed uh, with the uh, Marx lecture, please? It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Frank Lewis as the 2015 Gerald Marx lecturer. Dr. Lewis is the executive director of the American Board of Surgery. Dr. Lewis received his medical degree from the University of Maryland and completed his general surgery residency at the University of California, San Francisco. He then completed an NIH trauma fellowship at San Francisco General Hospital and joined the faculty there, where he became professor and vice chair of the Department of Surgery at UCSF and chief of surgery at San Francisco General Hospital. He subsequently became the chair of the Department of Surgery at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. In 2002, Dr. Lewis became executive director of the American Board of Surgery. Dr. Lewis has held numerous other leadership positions in American surgery, including past chair of the board and of the Residency Review Committee for Surgery of the ACGME, past president of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma and Shock Society, first vice president of the American College of Surgeons, and chair of the ACS Board of Governors. Dr. Lewis's clinical interests have centered on trauma and critical care. General surgery has undergone tremendous changes in the last 15 years, and there is no one in the world who has the broad perspective 
on general surgery training that Dr. Lewis does. He will speak with us today on surgical residency redesign, what needs to change. Dr. Lewis, it's a pleasure to have you at the SAGES meeting. It's a distinct honor to be asked to speak here, um, and uh, in particular, to be able to thank everyone for the tremendous help that SAGES has given to the board over the last few years. Probably for the last six or eight years, I've had uh, close working relationships with uh, the leadership of SAGES uh, in multiple projects, and the contributions of SAGES to uh, the SCORE uh, website uh, to material that was contributed uh, without charge uh, to the board and with the work that's been done in regard to advancing certification has been exemplary. Uh, Sally Matthews uh, and her staff <clears throat> were instrumental in helping with the rollout of FLS and making that happen uh, without their uh, uh, assistance they would have had uh, much more difficulty getting started and getting logged. So the relationship between the board and SAGES uh, has really been extraordinary and certainly much greater than I think with any other organization, uh, any other surgical specialty organization. So I'm quite grateful to them for the contributions they've made for what they continue to do. Uh, I think SAGES through its development of courses like FLS, FES, and now FUSE, uh, provide major contributions to surgical education and the organization has had a vigor and a dynamism in taking the initiative and developing many of these things that's really not seen in other organizations and the willingness to share this altruistically uh, has been outstanding. So I'm quite grateful to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm not a member of SAGES because uh, I grew up in an earlier era uh, when we needed to uh, look at the upper or lower GI tract, we did it through rigid steel tubes. And uh, when the revolution in endoscopy and laparoscopy came along, I was relatively far advanced in my career. I learned to do laparoscopy uh, in a limited way before I retired from clinical practice, but really never enjoyed it. It was uh, not much fun. Uh, my role, uh, my idea of fun was uh, xiphoid to pubis incision, so you could really get in there and look around and do things. And so I never adapted to the other, but I do applaud what you've done. Uh, the laparoscopic revolution is certainly the biggest thing that's happened in surgery in the last 50 years and has totally changed our practice. What I want to talk to you about today is the issue of redesigning surgical education because it has uh, come front and center in the last few years, and there's a great deal of accelerating push to do something uh, because people have the sense that surgical residency has not kept up with the times and things need to change. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of irrational thought about exactly what's needed, so I'd like to take the time today to outline for you what my thoughts are in regard to the issues that have caused the problem and the things that we need to do, hopefully, to solve them. I'm not going to provide you with any answers. Uh, I'm going to try and raise questions for you to address because uh, young creative leadership like you have is what we need to address some of these problems. Uh, my talk this morning will be divided into three parts, really. An initial part to illustrate just how hard it is to try and define what the problems are that we need to solve. A second part, which will describe the seven major issues that have put us where we are and created the problems today. And the third part, which will address some ideas for what I think we need to do to solve these problems and improve surgical residency and redesign it. My first point is the disclaimer uh, to point out that, that I speak only of my personal opinions. I'm not representing any opinions of the American Board of Surgery here, and I want to explicitly state these are personal opinions, and what I'm going to talk about 
does not represent any actions or things taken by the board. The opinions among the directors of the board are diverse, and the things I'm going to say are certainly not reflective of any consensus opinion. First of all, there's an increasing uh, drumbeat of criticism of surgical training, but it's really not a new issue. Uh, the criticisms began in the 80s uh, with the evolution of uh, pediatric surgery and then vascular surgery. Vascular surgery was created in uh, 1982, and uh, there was a great deal of concern about the splintering of general surgery uh, that uh, made that happen. Uh, and it has only accelerated since that time. There was a classic paper that uh, Dr. Brownell Wheeler published in 1993, which uh, was titled Myth and Reality in General Surgery. Uh, he was the first to point out that the actual experience of general surgical residents in doing uh, advanced cases of any sort was extremely small, and that the uh, experience of general surgical residents for about 20 cases uh, was all that they really had significant numbers for. And after you went above 20 cases, the end dropped below 10 and typically below 5. So that hasn't changed any. Uh, it's been recognized for a long time. And the reality is that surgical residents don't get a lot of experience doing high-end cases, esophagectomies, pancreatectomies, et cetera. The, um, debate, I think, or the criticisms were accelerated uh, by an article published uh, by Matar and other Fellowship Council uh, program directors two years ago uh, in which they looked at the uh, opinions of program directors regarding surgical residents who had finished a five-year program and were coming into fellowships, and they specifically looked at several aspects of their performance and were critical of their preparation. Uh, they concluded that 30% of the residents could not independently perform a lap coli, uh, that about uh, two-thirds of them had difficulty operating independently for more than 30 minutes. Uh, their laparoscopic skills were suboptimal in multiple ways, uh, and that they had difficulty in clinical management of patients with complications uh, and uh, demonstrated a lack of patient ownership. Uh, this particular paper has stirred a great deal of discussion and controversy and to some extent has resulted in pushes for the board to do something about the problem. This is the result of a survey that the board conducted just over a year ago of all surgical residents who graduated within the last five years. The response rate on the survey was just under 70%, so it was quite good. And among other things, the residents were asked how comfortable they were with doing a series, <clears throat> series of different procedures. And you see the top blue bars there are laparoscopic appendectomy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And the highly confident or mostly confident answers total nearly 100%. So, and these were the people who had done five years of surgery, not fellowships. So the views of the residents as to what they are capable of and the views of the program directors are clearly divergent. You can see as you move down that slide to other procedures that are done less frequently that the confidence begins to slide a little. And if you go into this slide and you look at procedures which are done less frequently, uh, you see that the relative confidence of residents uh, slides further. Uh, and thyroidectomy, uh, AV fistula placement, and other procedures you can see there suffer from a lack of confidence. But the common procedures that are done on that first slide, by and large, the residents state that they feel perfectly comfortable doing those independently. Matar basically found, again, that about a third could not independently perform a lap coli and that basic laparoscopic skills were lacking in a third to a half of the graduating residents. Yet lap coles are the commonest operation performed by residents, and in the 2014 graduating class, the median number of lap coles done by residents was 118. The 
lowest number for any resident reported in 2014 was 37. The highest number was 318. So something is wrong here. If this level of experience does not result in the ability to perform a procedure competently and independently, then something is highly wrong in the training program. And I cite all of this to illustrate the difficulty the board has in trying to analyze exactly what the problem is. Because if residents can't learn to do an operation after doing it 118 times, there really is something critically wrong in how they're being taught. These are other commonly done procedures, and the numbers that I show you, <coughs> show you there are the median number of procedures that were reported in the 2014 graduating class. You can see that while they're not huge, uh, they should be more than adequate to develop competence in virtually all of those procedures. Uh, the total for those common procedures is just under 300. And the number of uh, laparoscopic cases uh, that are included in that list are significantly over 150. So we have a dichotomy here and a uh, view that really is not clear. The, the data that we have is fundamentally inconsistent with the conclusions reached in the article by Matar. The case numbers for common operations should be adequate for residents to have learned how to do them competently. The laparoscopic procedures should be enough to have developed laparoscopic skills, and the residents themselves obviously express confidence in their ability to do those cases. So either the Matar assessment is overly critical or something is heavily wrong in the way these are reported and the program directors and residents are misrepresenting their experience as surgeon and those op reports essentially are meaningless. Now, at the present time, we actually don't know which of those is true, but they really cannot both be true. And there is really inadequate good data to clearly define the problem. So my primary message to you from this first part of the talk is, it's going to be extremely difficult to redesign a system when we don't know exactly what the problem is. And clearly, I cite this as, as a prime example of the contradictory information that we get all the time, which results in multiple diverse opinions about where we need to go. I want to shift now to the second part of the talk, which is to outline for you the specific things that I think can be cited as changes in the last 20 years in residency that have reduced the overall resident experience. The first is that there's markedly reduced exposure of medical students to surgical experience in medical school. The rotational time on surgical rotations has been uh, reduced typically to four to eight weeks. Much of that spent in surgical specialties rather than general surgery. Uh, medical students are rarely given direct patient care responsibilities today. They function more as spectators than as acting interns. Uh, it's uncommon for medical students to actually take any night call and have direct patient care responsibilities uh, that they would, where they would be asked to do anything and the teaching of basic procedural skills uh, that are used clinically are usually lacking. The second issue is that the relative teaching that occurs in different residencies is highly variable, uh, really dramatically variable, in fact. This is a graph of the results of the American Board of Surgery written and oral examinations, uh, and this reflects the averages of pass rates for all residencies in the country over a five-year period, uh, five years worth of graduates. The horizontal axis is the oral exam, written exam, the vertical axis, the oral exam. The dashed lines in the middle are the 65% threshold mandated by the RRC as a minimal level. Uh, each dot represents one residency program, about 250 total. And you can see that the distribution is enormous. It's a scattergram, uh, basically. 
About 20% of the programs lie to the left or below the dashed lines. So about 20% of the programs in the country are below the RRC threshold on either the written or the oral or both. Roughly another 20% of programs are between 65 and 70% on the two axes. Uh, so we could say that nearly 40% of the programs in the country fall below a 70% average pass rate over a five-year period for all graduates. Uh, that's for an examination which is not designed to be elitist. The board examinations are designed to be a minimal hurdle for people to get over to demonstrate their basic safety in caring for patients. So there really is a significant problem in a large number of residency programs and there's extraordinary variability in the relative teaching effectiveness of those programs. The single variable which correlates with that to the greatest extent is the size of the program. The vertical bars here represent the combined five-year pass rate in when the oral and the written are combined both. So the vertical bars represent the likelihood of having all of your graduates pass both the oral and the written examination on the first attempt. The individual bars are programs of different size. The left-hand bar are programs that graduate two residents a year. The right-hand bar are programs that graduate seven or more residents per year. You can see there's a pretty good linear correlation between those and a little over 10% variability between the lowest and the highest. So the size of a residency program has a very, very strong correlation with performance on the uh, certification exams of the board uh, and makes a striking difference. Presumably that relates to the resources available and the breadth of experience that residents have in those programs. The smaller programs obviously lack more sophisticated services. They don't have transplant, trauma, cardiac, et cetera. And the larger programs do have those and have a lot more faculty members. But the dependence on size is clearly very great and the overall variability in resident teaching is much greater than it should be. The third issue uh, are the reduced, uh, the changes in, in basic surgery, the reduced, reduced breadth, complexity, and the techniques for resident operative experience. There have been really extraordinary changes uh, in 20 years. The laparoscopic revolution was the biggest of those because 50 to 70 percent of abdominal procedures are now done laparoscopically rather than open. That may even be a low number today. Uh, there have been several types of surgery which have essentially uh, nearly disappeared. Uh, gastric and duodenal ulcer procedures, uh, biliary tree procedures, portal vein procedures, and abdominal vascular procedures. Um, trauma has declined dramatically. One of the better kept secrets in this country is that the volume of penetrating trauma between 1992 and 2002 went down by two-thirds. Uh, Mayor Giuliani claims it's for better policing in New York, but that actually had nothing to do with it because it happened everywhere, uh, in all parts of the country, in every city in the country, urban, rural, and whatever. And the criminologists have no idea why it occurred, interestingly enough. But what it did was eliminate penetrating trauma to a large part as a source of operations that residents got a great deal of experience on. Uh, when I graduated, the average resident had between 40 and 50 trauma cases, mostly laparotomies uh, at the time of graduation. Today, the number is less than 10. So there's been a 70 to 80 percent reduction in trauma experience surgically. Uh, all of those changes have fundamentally changed the character of general surgical training and the experience which the residents get uh, and have obviously dramatically reduced the open abdominal surgical experience that they get. Next is the impact of the 80-hour work week. And uh, I'm not speaking one way or the other about the, the desirability of the 80-hour work week, but just a purely mechanical calculation will show you that if you spend 100 hours a week in the hospital for five years, that amounts to about 24,000 hours. Uh, 90 hours, about 21.6, and 80 hours, about 19.2. So if you think that surgical residents went from 100 to 80 hours, that means they had a 48-hour reduction in in-hospital time. 
which amounts to a year's worth of 100-hour weeks. If you think it was 90 hours, that's half as much, obviously, and it's six months of 100-hour weeks. So no matter how you calculate it, the in-hospital experience of residents was dramatically reduced, even though the time in place did not change, but the actual experience in the hospital went down dramatically with the implementation of the 80-hour work week, and there's really been no compensation for that. In addition, if you do some simple back of the napkin calculations about where that occurred, and you estimate that residents spend 12 hours a day, five days a week doing daytime activity, that's 60 hours during daytime, Monday to Friday. With a 100-hour week, that left 40 hours additional for night and weekend activity, and with 80 hours, at least 20. So the night and weekend activity has actually gone down by 50%. And that was the time when residents were more likely to have the opportunity for some degree of independence, autonomy, and independent assessment of patients. So the reduction of time overall has been six to 12 months, but it's been disproportionately reflected in night and weekend activity. So we conclude that the 80-hour week has really taken a huge amount of time out of residency, but it's, it's kind of uh, invisible because they still spend five years doing the residency, but it's a real thing. The reduction has been mostly in night and weekend activity, and the elective surgical experience, which people tend to look at in evaluating the number of cases which residents do, has really not been affected, and so the numbers that you see reflected in most of the elective surgery doesn't show much change, so people think nothing much has happened. But in fact, it's been a dramatic effect. So uh, we have not really done anything to change this or reflect this loss of time. Uh, next is the issue of autonomy and independence, which a great deal has been written about recently. And there are multiple factors uh, which have impacted this. Uh, over a 30 or 40 year period of time, the basic ethics of caring for the indigent patient has changed. Uh, the concept of indigent patients providing teaching material for residents clearly disappeared along the way in the 70s and 80s and is no longer uh, ethically acceptable. Uh, the cultural approach to this is totally different today and resident supervision is essentially universal across all patients. There are no more chief resident services as there were in my day uh, when the residents were given almost total responsibility for managing a group of patients on their own. There have been increased financial pressures on academic surgeons to generate clinical activity that pays for departmental activities and salaries, and that has led to the presence in the OR for virtually all cases of surgeons in academic institutions. The path audits which were carried out by Medicare about 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, and the massive penalties which were uh, exacted from some academic institutions only increased the paranoia for that and led to increasing uh, resident oversight, uh, attending oversight of residents. The legal standard related to the ability to operate independently is board eligibility or board certification. That's not actually a very rational standard because one day before the resident graduates, they're considered unable to perform anything independently, and one day afterward, they're considered to be able to perform everything independently. From a medical perspective, it obviously makes no sense, but that is the legal standard. So if a resident is operating on a patient prior to being board eligible, and the patient suffers a major complication and there's no attending in evidence, uh, your chance of having a major malpractice award is going to go through the roof. Once you're board eligible and you're in a fellowship, that really no longer applies and you're theoretically at least able to manage patients independently and make your own decisions. So from a practical perspective, what that means is that autonomy and independence for residents in a meaningful way is going to be very difficult to achieve during residency, but is relatively easy to achieve in fellowship. And that has implications for the way in which we redesign residency. 
We also need to remember, and I think there's not nearly enough conversation about this, that independence and autonomy is a double-edged sword. The other edge of the sword is patient quality of care. Uh, we cannot advocate for greater autonomy for residents if the residents themselves are not competent in what they do and if patients are exposed to management by people who are not, in fact, capable of caring for them totally. So we need to be sure we're aware of both of those because if we push this issue of autonomy and independence without cognizance of what it means for patient safety and without ensuring that patients are being appropriately cared for, uh, we're going to come off very badly in the whole thing. The greatest importance for assuring the ability to function autonomously is actually better assessment and documentation of resident competence. But in reality, that's not very well done in most residencies. Uh, our system of monitoring residents is largely informal. We scrub with them in the OR. We get a sense of how they're doing. But we almost never establish a formal evaluation in which we say, OK, today I'm only going to first assist you. You do this operation. I'll only do what you tell me to do. Uh, and we're going to see if you actually know how to do the whole thing. That's almost never done as an explicit exercise. So we need to do much better in terms of objective assessment of resident capabilities for completing operations. Lastly, uh, we have significant issues in regard to basic uh, general surgical training because we're asking residency to do two different things, basically. We want residency, on the one hand, to provide some sort of core general surgical training for those who are going on into specialty practice. And we want, we haven't really clearly defined exactly what that should be, but there's a lot of pressure to shorten the general surgical residency uh, to three or four years in order to allow those people to progress to specialty practice more uh, sooner. In addition, however, residency has to provide full training for general surgeons uh, in order to create a general surgeon who can competently operate across a very wide range of procedures in all environments and provide emergency surgical call. The five-year program we have is a one-size-fits-all for both of the above objectives, but in fact, they are different, and I would contend that we need to redesign residency to reflect that difference. Uh, we currently haven't done that, and while there are a lot of efforts to talk about shortening, I think few of them have clearly delineated exactly what the implications of that are. Now I have a little short quiz from you for you just to illustrate uh, the number of subspecialties that we have to contend with. Uh, how many different specialty fellowships, either accredited by the ACGME or not accredited, do you think are regularly available to residents who complete a five-year surgical residency? Uh, is it A, five to 10? Raise your hands. B, 10 to 15? few takers. C, 15 to 20? Quite a few takers. D, 20 to 25? Uh, about a third. The right answer is 23. So I illustrate this because it's more than most people think. And the specific specialties that are involved are the following. There are the ABS specialties, vascular peds, critical care, hand surgery, hospice palliative medicine, and oncology. There are the other three boards which are related to general surgery, colon, rectal, thoracic, and plastics. And then there are the non-ACGME fellowships, which are shown here. And the fellowship council fellowships listed there at the bottom encompass about seven different areas. So we really have a highly challenging job here to try and design a core training program which will adequately prepare people for going into this diverse range of specialties. The actual numbers in each of these specialties is shown here uh, in descending order of frequency. Uh, this is data, again, from the 2014 uh, graduating class of residents when they took the written exam last summer, total of about 1,150 responses. The number of people indicating they were going into general surgery is higher here 
than most of the recent estimates. It's about 27%. Most of the time we hear about 20% being quoted. And you can see all of the others there. So the numbers are quite variable. And over on the far side, the number that go into hand or burn surgery, et cetera, is down in the single digits. So trying to design a core program that's going to adequately prepare people and appropriately prepare them for all of these areas is really quite challenging. These then are the seven things that I identify as the prime causes of the difficulties in which we find ourselves. What then are the possible solutions and what needs to change? Uh, let me run through uh, seven or eight things here that I think are where we should focus our time and recognize that most of the things which have caused the problem for residents, the change in the environment, the change in technology, the 80-hour work week, the change in ability to have independence and autonomy, all of those things are irreversible. They're not, you can't go back and recoup what you had 40 years ago. So the solutions have to be found somewhere else. And we have to look creatively at what might be possible to solve these problems without going back and trying to change what we cannot modify at the present time. The first thing is to look at the medical student experience in the senior year. Senior year, by and large, is a wasted year today. And the medical students really don't function as acting interns to any great extent. There's been a distinct movement in recent years to try and increase the training of senior, res senior students in procedural things, the so-called boot camp, and to do that in the last month or two of medical school after the match occurs, once those people know that they're matched to a surgical program. The American College of Surgeons and the APDS have collaborated to put together a really excellent uh, skills curriculum, Ajit Sach Diva, oversaw this uh, a few years ago. And the program they have outlined and the implementation of that is really superbly done. Unfortunately, there are fewer than a third of the medical schools that have actually implemented it. Um, time at the end of the fourth year of medical school is probably the ideal time to do this. But because it will not be done across the board, uh, it also can be done during the early weeks or months of internship. And I think we need to uh, basically think about implementation of programs like this that will teach basic surgical skills to 100% of interns during the first part of their training if they did not obtain this during medical school. We tend to think that our old ways of see one, do one, teach one are adequate. But in fact, those do not train people to do basic procedures well. You would think that something as simple as inserting an NG tube would be hard to screw up. But in fact, every year, NG tubes get put down the trachea of obtunded patients, and, and uh, liquid food gets injected, creates aspiration pneumonia. Uh, every year, putting in Foley catheters gets done improperly, and a balloon gets inflated in a prostatic urethra and ruptures the urethra. Uh, on a regular basis, central lines cause pneumothoraces because they're not being done using ultrasound guidance or other techniques. So even the simplest of procedures can be easily screwed up and patients can be harmed. Uh, having a didactic training experience where incoming interns are taught to do it properly and safely would have enormous value in patient safety. So we need to look at ways of doing that and of implementing this sort of basic training across the board. If it's not been done in medical school, it really needs to be done in internship. Next, the focus of most of the discussion has really been on time and training, four, five, or six years. But no one has yet proposed that we do something to change the basic teaching and make it more efficient. And in my opinion, changing the time without changing the training, particularly if you shorten the training, is only going to give you a less well-prepared product. Uh, I believe it's Albert Einstein who is credited with the saying that insanity consists of doing things the same way as you have before and expecting a different result. 
and that really applies here. If we don't fundamentally change the way we train house staff, then the ability to have them progress more rapidly and become competent in a shorter time is clearly not going to happen. And residency experience, particularly in the junior years, is really an incredibly inefficient process. Think for a minute about the current standard <clears throat> for operative requirements for junior residents, 250 cases in the first two years, and that includes a number of procedures that are not really operations. That amounts to two to three cases per week, or a total of six to nine hours a week out of a total of 80 approximately spent in the hospital. It would be hard to imagine a more inefficient payback of learning than that is. In addition, the intellectual environment for the first couple of years of house staff training is by and large mind-numbing and stifling. Residents are not challenged as they should be. They're not given independence at an advanced level. Uh, they're given relatively mundane tasks and a lot of repetitive stuff that they're not learning from. And we really have not addressed the ability to train them in a much more creative and challenging way. There's an experiment currently going on in Canada at the orthopedics program in Toronto. It was originally designed by Richard Resnick, who's been a real pioneer in this area. And basically, the house staff who enter the program are dropped into modular rotations starting from the very first day and they are taught to do complex operations. Uh, and in, if the group happens to get on the hip service, within three months they're doing total hip replacements as interns. Uh, the ability of house staff to learn and progress rapidly has really not been challenged and not been taken advantage of at all. Remember, these are people in their mid to late 20s. They're at the most intellectually and physically capable time in their life. Uh, they could easily do much more than we allow them to do. And we simply are sticking with a paradigm that's now 100 years old without thinking creatively about how we can do it differently. And we, we badly need to approach this from the point of view of making it a greater intellectual challenge, of advancing the house staff much more quickly in their operative capabilities, and of ensuring that they, in fact, are capable of doing things with greater didactic testing rather than just a casual, well, it looks like you're doing that okay. So we need, this is an area where we particularly need creative thinking and experimental models. A paper uh, that was published a couple of years ago, again with Dr. Resnick, is instructive in this regard, and it's related to the orthopedic experience. This was uh, published in the Annals, and basically it was a study in which 20 interns coming into the program who had never done any laparoscopic surgery before were randomized into two groups. One group simply received conventional resident education. The other group was taken through an explicit cognitive and technical teaching exercise over a period of about four weeks and taught how to do laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Once the two groups had completed that, they, they then were asked to do five consecutive lap coles and were observed critically in doing those. The trained group basically did extremely well and performed at a proficient level and showed relatively little progression over the five because they already were doing them well. The other group obviously did very poorly and there were dramatic differences between them. Uh, it was the first time that anyone had shown the ability to, in an ex vivo way, didactically train someone up to full competence in doing a relatively complex operation and have that applied directly to their experience. And it was not a group of people who had any experience heretofore. So I recommend that paper to all of you because I think it provides a model for the sort of thing we have to think about of an entirely different method for preparing residents to do operations rather than the much more haphazard method that we currently use. The fundamental approach, in my opinion, to resident teaching needs to change. 
Uh, you've seen there how variable the teaching effectiveness is at different residency programs. I think we need to give residents far more explicit responsibility for their own education using online resources. We need to provide outlines of what is expected and what sort of competencies we expect them to achieve on a PGY level as they progress through residency. And we need to provide them with the methods for self-assessing how they're doing, which will provide comparisons with their peers. Uh, I don't know how many of you have looked at the Khan Academy, but the Khan Academy is an online teaching resource which has had extraordinary success in the last four years. And they have a somewhat different model of learning. Uh, the Khan Academy has a series of modules which typically take 20 to 30 minutes to complete. They now cover more than 4,000 subject areas. Uh, early on, it was mostly, mostly math and physics. Now it encompasses everything. And the model is that you take a test after completing the module, and if you don't get a perfect score, you go back and do it again. So the goal is not to get a 70% pass. The goal is to get 100%, learn the material, and you can go back and do it as often as you like without any penalty in order to reach that point. That sort of a model using online resources and using teaching material is the sort of thing I think we need to do for residents. And we need to have a more explicit curriculum for them illustrating what they're expected to know. Uh, the SCORE website could provide the structure for this, uh, but to date, we have only had a suggested curriculum. We haven't moved it into any sort of re required level. The next thing that I think needs to change is that our view of general surgery uh, needs to be consciously altered. Uh, I think we need to recognize that full training in general surgery needs to be recognized as a specialty which is equivalent to all others and not as simply core training. Uh, we keep dancing around this issue in terms of whether general surgery is core to something else or whether it stands alone as its own specialty. In every other English-speaking country, general surgery is treated as its own specialty equivalent to the other specialties. And in fact, I think that's what we should do here. We should simply consciously recognize that there's a training track for general surgery, the same as for vascular, pediatric, or anything else, and recognize them as equivalent. I also think that those who want to do general general surgery need to spend an additional year in training to compensate for the multiple factors which I've already outlined, which have compromised training over the last 15 or so years. We need to find a way to bifurcate the residency training experience to provide shorter training in core surgery for those who are going into specialties and extending the training for residents who are going into general general surgery in one way or another. And whether we should do that through extending residency or creating general surgical fellowships seems to me to be an open question. Uh, there are arguments to be made on both sides. Currently, the problem, of course, is that the only specialty which fulfills those basic requirements currently is acute care surgery. Uh, acute care surgery is an additional two years, including a year of critical care, uh, which, in, which basically addresses primarily urgent and emergent surgical conditions. But the number of positions available is only about 20. So it's roughly 10% of the need for roughly 200 graduates every year who end up going into general surgery. The American College of Surgeons is currently in the midst of developing transition to practice fellowships, which would function in a similar way as a year of fellowship following the five-year residency. But the success and, and whether those will be attractive to surgical residents or not is not answered. It's a new experiment. There are only six people in fellowships this year. Uh, next year, there will be about 20. Uh, whether that will increase to supply the numbers is currently unknown. And other than that, there are no general surgical fellowships of any kind that are around. How they might be created and whether or not they would impinge on general surgical resident experience uh, is obviously something that requires a great deal of thought and study. In that same survey that we did of the residents that I referenced earlier, uh, we asked the question here, if general surgical residency were six years in length, 
uh, what would you have selected? And on the left-hand side, you see that uh, about a little over two-thirds would have continued to select general surgery. And on the right-hand side, about 63%, uh, when it was asked if you had to do a fellowship in general surgery, would you have entered the field? So whether or not residents would find a six-year objectionable, objectionable or not appears not to be a huge issue, but it obviously is consideration. Next, we need to think carefully in our training paradigms about what it is that the public really needs. And the, the most urgent and largest public need at the present time is for general general surgeons in multiple community hospitals all around the country. This is the hardest positions to fill at the moment. It's the one where the recruiting is going on intensively. And for any hospital administrator, this is the most difficult position they have to fill. Uh, the problem is not getting any better. It's gradually getting worse. And the number of surgeons who are qualified to do this is clearly less than the demand. So as we think about this, we need to think about how we're going to supply this need. And one of the problems that people cite is constantly they say, well, there are no general surgeons in the universities because everyone is a specialist. Ergo, the models that residents see don't predispose them to thinking about broad general surgical practice. So exactly how we're going to design this remains unknown. And the second uh, socioeconomic factor that's totally relevant is that we need to recognize that the way in which surgeons practice and the way in which they're employed are changing rapidly. Uh, about 60% of surgeons are now employed, and that number is increasing significantly, something in the range of 5% a year. Hospital employment is probably the most common, and medical group practice the other. Solo practice is decreasing steadily. So as those types of practice change, the breadth of surgery and the type of surgery that the surgeons do is also going to change. Currently, there's really very little information about that and nothing that's being used to influence the design of residency training. Let me come back now to the specialties that I showed you before. We have the ACGME accredited specialties, which are listed here, and the non-ACGME accredited specialties, which are listed here. So we have 23 different specialties with two fundamentally different accreditation systems. The number of residents which go in, who go into each is roughly 50-50. In fact, there's no reason why there should be separate accreditation systems. The people going into these programs all have finished general surgical residency. They all are going to practice in one specialty area or another. And this is basically a chaotic system in which the level of accreditation is highly variable depending on what the specialty is, but it's on a purely chance basis. It doesn't reflect any sort of rationality. So we need a mechanism for more uniform accreditation of post-residency fellowships in order to ensure greater coordination and integration among them and to ensure that the standards which are maintained in all of those areas are similar. The Fellowship Council has done a yeoman's job in the last three to four years of increasing the level of stringency in their accreditation system uh, and it may well be that it's relatively adequate at the present time. I don't know the details of it, but it's likely that it would have more credibility if it were functioning under some other umbrella, such as the ACGME or possibly the college, if the college should decide to take this on. We clearly, I think, need a new model in which accreditation of specialty residencies is done by specialty societies. I'm not a great fan of the current ACGME accreditation methods because they do not use specialists in the accreditation of residencies. They use PhDs who have had some educational experience, but those people by and large don't understand the clinical environment, and as a result, their accreditation decisions are not the best informed in terms of what residents need. Uh, the strength of the model, such as the Fellowship Council is doing, is that you have specialists who are familiar with the training area doing the accreditation, and therefore the decisions made, in my opinion, are much more relevant to what the residents need. 
Uh, on the other hand, that does not exist under any sort of a broader umbrella, so there's no assurance of uniform accreditation standards across a variety of different specialties. Uh, in my opinion, we also need to consider a different certification mechanism for these, and the ABMS is currently debating this, in which those who would finish an accredited residency in the specialty areas would actually receive some sort of a certificate of special expertise or additional expertise in that area, which would be short of a subspecialty certificate, but would evidence further training beyond general surgery. Uh, whether the ABMS will act on that or not is still an open question. So I feel that the current structure of fellowships, which are completely outside the general surgical residency structure, creates an inherently competitive and sometimes adversarial relationship. As all of you know, there's a great deal written on both sides of the question about whether fellowships negatively impact on surgical residencies or whether they enhance training. And there are certainly fellows, uh, articles in both directions. Uh, Nat Soper's paper from Northwestern a couple of years ago uh, approached it from a different direction when he showed that when he discontinued the advanced fellowships at Northwestern, the resident experience in those areas increased markedly. Uh, so at least in that institution, the answer was resident experience was improved by getting rid of the fellowships. Uh, I'm not suggesting that that's universally true, but I am suggesting that within a given institution, there needs to be much greater integration and cooperation of the training between the two in order to enhance optimal training for both sides. There are clearly procedures which should be done in fellowship. There are other procedures which should be done in residency as part of the training of a competent general surgeon, and we should be able to do a better job of delineating those and figuring out exactly how they should be separated. So, so my message here, I think I'm pushing the wrong button, sorry. So my message here is that uh, we need to uh, think about ways in which the integration of those could be better done. In summary then, when we look at what needs to change, the eight things which I've outlined here for you are we need to start looking at the skills training and validation of training for medical students during their senior year or early in internship. We need to greatly modify the way in residents, residents learn and adopt a more resident-centered learning model using online resources and low-stakes self-assessment and more clearly outlining the expectations. We need to dramatically increase the early operative involvement of residents and advance that to a much more complex level than we currently do, and we need to have a much more defined and validated method of demonstrating competence to perform procedures. If we did that, we could dramatically increase the level of autonomy which is possible in residency because we could be assured of the level of performance that the residents would be able to carry out. I believe that we need to define general surgery as a specialty equivalent to all the others and clearly separate the core training in general surgery and residency from general surgery as a defined specialty, uh, and that we need to do that in order to simply have equivalence of all the tracks. I think we need two tracks in residency, one that probably could be four years in length for those who are going into specialties, and one for general general surgery that I think should be six years in length in order to compensate for the things which have been taken out of residency in the last several years. Um, I believe that uh, uh, we need to ensure that the training paradigms that we adopt and the things we expect residents to do are targeted to public need and to the changing employment status and types of roles that general surgeons will be asked to fulfill. And lastly, I think we need a much more integrated accreditation model between residency and fellowships to eliminate much of the conflict which has gone on there over the last few years. With that, I thank you again for the opportunity to discuss this and for the opportunity to be here.
Dr. Lewis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, just an incredible uh, view of uh, the present and future of residency training. I have this plaque I'd like to uh, present, which has the quote, anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. 2015 Gerald Marks Lecturer from Sages. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You. The, the staff did a great job of finding the quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.
So if we could ask everyone to get settled, we're going to start the presidential debates very soon. There they are, Scott and Nat are walking over with their coffee. All right, so good morning and welcome. This is the uh, SAGES presidential debate session. Uh, this is always one of the highlights of the meeting and uh, it's my privilege to be chairing this session today. My name is Christopher Schlachter and my co-chair today, of course, is Joe Beiske, SAGES past president 2011, I believe. Uh, before I give you much more information right now, I am going to uh, let you know that part of this session today is going to involve audience participation. You are going to have the opportunity to vote on debate topics as well as voting on the outcomes of the debate. And there are three ways that you can do that. You can log into your SAGES app where you will be able to um, uh, submit your vote online. You can do it through the SAGES website and you can also do it by texting your vote and I believe the number was 22333. So uh, whatever you need to do to get yourself ready for online access and able to submit your vote, I will encourage you to do that now while I'm doing a little bit of housework. So to start with, the objectives of this session. At the conclusion of this session, participants will be able to evaluate challenges facing healthcare quality in 2015 and the near future, recognize the impact that technology is having on delivery of healthcare, and assess strategies for embracing and mitigating these challenges from the standpoint of experienced surgical leadership. And in order to help you uh, address those learning objectives, we are going to have two debates today. We've uh, added a twist this year, uh, something brand new that we're doing at the presidential debates, which is that uh, two, one of our debates today, our debaters do not know what they're going to be debating yet. And we're going to ask you to choose their debate topic. So before we do that, a few rules about how these debates are going to be conducted. I've brought these with me so that I remember what I'm going to say. Here we go. So this is how the debates are going to proceed. Uh, we're going to begin with an audience vote. First of all, we'll choose topics and we'll do that in a second. Then for each debate, we will begin with an audience vote on the debate topic to establish pre-debate bias. Then each debater is going to have six minutes to represent their side of the argument. The pro side of the argument will go first. Afterwards, each side will then be given three minutes for rebuttal and we're going to be fairly strict with those times. Uh, we will then end the debate with another audience vote and the winner of the debate will be declared based on who moves the audience more towards their section. So a pre-debate of 95% uh, doesn't necessarily help you. Uh, the second thing is that SAGES takes conflict of interest very seriously and the Conflict of Interest Task Force has reminded me to tell our debaters that if there is any real or perceived conflict of interest in your presentation, please declare that to the audience before you give your presentation. And then finally, I've been implored to go over the rules of decorum for this debate. So uh, our past presidents who are all debating today are reminded of the rules of decorum for past presidents. These are in page 17 of the SAGES Past Presidents Manual. <laughs> They've been adopted from the uh, rules of decorum for past presidents of societies of endoscopic surgery, version 4, 2011. Uh, all debaters are reminded that as past presidents and ambassadors of SAGES, professional decorum should be respected at all times. This strictly prohibits the excessive use of profanity, revealing comments about marital status of the opponent's parents or metaphorical comparisons to reproductive anatomy, biting, scratching, gouging of eyes, and any physical assault that causes excessive blood loss by either party is also prohibited, and all forms of weaponry and military hardware that has not been submitted to the speaker's prep room at least two hours prior to the advance of this session is uh, not allowed. And then finally, uh, for the purpose of this debate alone, failure to have fun uh, will be published by the requirement for a solo performance at tonight's sing-off. Having established that, 
we are now going to move on to our vote. So uh, the first uh, vote is uh, our debaters are going to be uh, Steve Schweitzberg, past president 2012, and Jerry Freed, past president 2014. And the two topics that you have the chance to um, ask them to debate are quality health care requires physician leaders or quality health care requires an assembly line. And so we've already received some votes there. We'll give you another 30 seconds to see if there's going to be any more votes registered. So I would, uh, I'm going to take the prerogative to say it looks very strongly right now, Drs. Fried and Schweitzberg, that you are going to be debating quality health care requires physician leaders. Now, because you can't both argue one or the other side of that debate, we are now going to switch to our second vote, and we're going to ask our audience to uh, please assign sides to that debate. So, uh, there's the codes and so on. Uh, if you want Dr. Sh uh, Freed to be pro and Dr. Schweitzberg to be con, or if you want Dr. Schweitzberg to be pro and Dr. Freed to be con, please register your votes now. Are you on the edge of your seat, gentlemen? <laughs> I don't know what the 16 means. All right, that's close enough. I think we're going to call it there. So the pro side of this debate is going to be uh, Dr. Jerry Fried, and the con side will be Dr. St Steve Schweitzberg. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we've decided to organize these debates in a modified George Lucas fashion. And in fact, we will be beginning with the second debate, and then we will have the first debate afterwards so Drs. Fried and Schweitzberg can stew over their approach. Uh, and so uh, for that, purpose, I am now going to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Beiske, who will introduce our second debate. Our second debate uh, will be held between our, our past chairs, Dr. Nat Soper and Dr. Scott Melvin. Uh, we did pre-select their topic, which was um, healthcare costs have become unaffordable. Dr. Melvin will take the um, the pro side of the negative statement, meaning Dr. Melvin is going to argue on the side that, pro, that healthcare costs are unaffordable. Dr. Soper will take the stand that, you know, at what cost good health, it's the most important thing we have and we're rich anyway. Um, so we do have one audience participation vote, I think, if we have a slide for it, which is um, who in the room agrees with the statement that healthcare costs are unaffordable. And if we don't have an audience participation slide for that, then we can do it with a show of hands. We do. So the pre-resolution debate, in favor of the statement that healthcare costs have become unaffordable. So the pre-vote is pretty strongly, if not 100% in favor of the statement that healthcare costs are unaffordable. So, oh, we have, a, we have some contrary votes, so it's about, uh, about three to one. I'm going to call it right now, 31 to 8. All right, so with that being said, Dr. Melvin, if you would get your, your, your fighting, fighting boots on and come and make your stand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It won't be uh, much of an argument because I think that we'll all be in agreement um, that uh, the use and the expenditures for new technology in surgery and healthcare are important. Let's define technology, and this is basically for Dr. Uh, Soper so that he understands what we're discussing. Um, it's a manner of accomplishing a task specifically using a technical processes, methods, or knowledge. And I wanted to break it down and make it relatively simple, so I'm going to ask you a question. You or one of your loved ones or, or family members uh, is discovered to have ITP, and the decision is made to uh, undergo a splenectomy. Your choices are to go to the doctor you referred to, a very cost-effective, a very efficient surgeon with years and years of experience and a tradition of very high-quality surgery. You see him, and he recommends a left subcostal incision a few days in the hospital and a splenectomy, one that you know will be very cheap. Uh, the other option is a very uh, a newer surgeon uh, uses a lot of high and very expensive equipment, but will do a laparoscopic splenectomy. He'll leave the hospital the next day and go back to whatever it is you do. 
Um, and so your question is personal at this point. So let's talk about the issues that he'll most likely address. The first is money. Value is money. Uh, the ethics of it likely he'll not consider. The ethics are uh, important and need to be considered when applying new technology, not just to your patient, but to the healthcare system as well. Perhaps the other things that need to be considered are that that may be more important to non-physicians, the marketing of your healthcare systems, we can't compete on cost within healthcare systems, so we need to compete in other issues, such as the availability of new technology. What we should be competing about is about patient care, and certainly the patient's perception of the level of that care. In reality, it's a triage of resources. How can we use expensive technology to effectively care for people? And then, of course, it's all about money. So we talk about the value and the value of this new technology, should we spend money on it? and the value to the medical center, the value to society, uh, and the value to the physicians who perform the procedures or techniques or technology, but really we should most likely consider the value to the patient, something that's not often considered in the forefront, and I, I wanted to demonstrate that. But first, let's take a step back. Technology's a good thing. As technology improves, computer technology improves, uh, it helps everything. It reduces costs. My phone today is cheaper than it was before. Nat, your flip phone is very cheap and has been uh, not uh, actually available anymore. Um, we've seen that in imaging, computers, new televisions, and that kind of thing, but it has a paradoxical effect in healthcare. New technology costs the healthcare industry more money and increases expenditure in the healthcare industry. So why is that? Let's look at some choices and some thoughts uh, from the think tank at, uh, at MIT. Um, there's a huge array of available treatments. Think about prostate cancer, rectal cancer, uh, many uh, other medical conditions. There's a large variety of uh, different treatments that may or may not be effective and have different levels of evidence to support their care. And the reimbursement for those technologies yet remains relatively strong, perhaps even generous, and doesn't require uh, evidence that they're one's better than the other. Reimbursement's not based on performance or outcomes. It's based on this new technology is no worse, and it costs more, and that's its use. And so we need to be careful to analyze that. So the technology cost and the increase in technology cost uh, really fall into three main categories. Uh, certainly the, the first is a, is a variable cost technology, uh, and this is really framing a decision. So three different levels of technology. Variable cost, uh, but big benefit, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Big benefit, variable cost. Antibiotics for infections, the flu vaccine, HIV drugs, expensive but very effective. Pretty important uh, category. The second category are high, higher cost uh, procedures but of questionable benefit or perhaps variable benefit. Cardiac stenting is very effective for uh, individuals who require it and for some individuals they'll get big benefit of it, perhaps at a higher cost. Lots of data would suggest that these high cost technology is used in a very large population, perhaps in a population of patients who don't provide, get the same benefit. And then lastly, high cost procedures with variable benefits, again, such as a proton beam accelerator that as a hospital administrator, once you go down this pathway, you spend the hundreds of millions of dollars to build it, you need to use it. You need to use it and we'll figure out whether it works later. Well, it's worthwhile to evaluate this, and this is a, a, a talk from uh, the New York Times, an editorial from the New York Times, uh, and a subsequent analysis from the Wharton Penn School of uh, uh, Business School and School of Medicine. Um, and actually, this faculty member said this about da Vinci, a pseudo-innovation, a technology that increases costs without improving patients' health care. Well, a lot of these cost analysis are flawed. They consider acquisition costs as a big part of the uh, treatment. It focuses on cost and not outcomes. It's written by economists and sometimes physicians or administrators and not, and not given an adequate benefit. 20 second warning. 20 second, okay, okay. Patients should be considered. The value to the individual patient is somewhat matters. The outcomes of less pain, faster recovery, and better function are really priceless. If there are limits on the technology, we're gonna a limit our low value innovation or a high value innovation are going to prevent future innovation. We need to have the halo effect. I need 30 seconds. Um, 
And lastly, we need to consider the ethical considerations. SAGES uh, has this position paper that was put out, uh, very effective. I would encourage all of you to look at it, uh, very communicative to talk about the ethical considerations. So let's make that la this last slide, make the decisions easy. Dr. Soper and the audience, the assumptions are that you are the patient, your loved one is the patient, and it's not your money you're spending. You have a great surgeon, you are a great surgeon, and you want the best for what you, what's worthwhile for you. What is the value of this new technology? I think everyone's conclusion would be that you wanted to use the best technology, despite the cost, for the best outcomes for the patient. Dr. Soper, relax, there is no rebuttal. Thank you. So do I have slides here too? It'd be nice. Did you deliver your carousel? I did, in fact. And, and, you know, I have to start with the usual thing that I say to all of my debate competitors. Scott, you ignorant slut. <laughs> uh, I think we have to all agree that healthcare technology is unaffordable in this day and age. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, disclosures, nothing relevant to this. Um, Healthcare spending as a percent of GDP in the United States is out of control. And, and a lot of this has to do with technology. It's thought the technology is one of the lead drivers in this. And much of the technology we use really isn't doing much. So you can put in a standard aortic or mitral valve. The cost of those has been relatively uh, stable over the last few years because of marketing decisions and because hospitals are not willing to stock 15 different valves at any one time anymore at around $5,000. But now we've got the, the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. The valve is $32,500 at, $32, at our hospital and the company won't underwrite it. We have to pay for it. The mitra clip, the, the percutaneous mitral valve device, is $30,000. And we're putting these things in left and right, but what's the value? It's not been proven. Um, this shows the cost of uh, a 24-week colorectal cancer treatment regimen, and it shows the uh, additional quality of life or uh, years that is gained by it. And you can see that the costs have gone up tremendously with little, if any, value to the underlying patient. So, Dr. Melvin, it does come down to the value equation in, in everything we do. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the da Vinci as a proxy for high technology. So, we look at all of the other technology. My, my flat screen TV at home, which is bigger than yours, Melvin, I can guarantee it, um, it costs much less today than it would have five years ago. Um, but the da Vinci robot, it's now virtually doubled in cost over the last few years. It, it is kind of cool, uh, highly marketed, and uh, you can't, as a urologist who really don't know how to do laparoscopy, you can't do a prostatectomy now without using the robot. Um, and, and what is the value of this? We in general surgery are also using the robot more and more. Uh, there have been a couple of national uh, 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 studies that have been gone out showing that the cost of doing specific operations, such as the Nissen fund application, the cost is $3,000 more on average. Um, the outcomes are no better with the robot. Likewise, for laparoscopic colorectal resections versus robotic ones, there's an increase of $5,000 to do these operations. And again, the outcomes are really no different. At our own institution, we looked into the prostate operations. We have a, a guy who still does open prostatectomies, has very good outcomes. Um, we look at the robot use just to turn it on, costs about $1,200 per case. Um, and the profitability to, to our hospital of a prostatectomy when done open is about $3,000, but when it's done robotically goes down to about $1,500, but when you add in all of the other costs associated with this great new technology, the profitability is only $200 a case. I say that we really can't afford this very, very expensive toy now, mind you, having had both rotator cuffs replaced for my non-ergonomic operating, I could see sitting at a console all day. So, in terms of value, Dr. Melvin, quality, 
has never been shown to be better with a robot, whereas the cost is significantly more. So in my mind, this is totally unjustifiable. And when you look at technology and the costs of technology, you also have to factor in lost opportunities. What else could you do with a, with a robot bought 10 years ago at $1.5 million? You could do all of these other things, 5,000 screening colonoscopies, 80,000 vaccinations, 20,000 HPV vaccinations, 100 cholecystectomies, 200 hernia repairs, or at our institution, we'd like to re rehab our operating rooms. We could outfit three integrated MIS operating rooms. So I think you have to carefully pick and choose your technology, and I would say that in this day and age, even though we've progressed a long way, we're now hunching over a computer screen, and maybe that's not the way we ought to do this. So I would say, in, in this day and age, that the cost of new technology that we're bringing in left and right is unaffordable, and we've got to stop this progression. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nat, for making my point. The, uh, what, what you've demonstrated very nicely is that uh, certain technology is very expensive and that we need to make triage decisions that are sometimes reasonable uh, in an environment of limited health care dollars. But you've ignored what matters most, and that's patient outcomes. Uh, it's clear that certain procedures are uh, beneficial uh, utilizing higher technology, and the availability of higher technology will no doubt improve outcomes. It may even improve outcomes for the uh, for people like yourself, the, the surgeons uh, that re require additional assistance like a robot to do these procedures as you become infirm. And so it's reasonable to consider spending this money. You've made an argument to save money for the system, for the health care uh, providers, for your hospital, uh, who now you're an employee of. Uh, but I would make the argument that uh, spending health care dollars and spending them wisely will improve patient outcomes and improve patient care across the board. Thank you. Unfortunately, Dr. Melvin is living in la-la land. <clears throat> he thinks we're still in the 1980s where we would come to this meeting and industry would take us out to eat and give us rounds of golf on the golf course and you name it. And we're now in a constrained environment in virtually everything we do and in our own institutions too. It, the the um, pigeons are coming home to roost and we must acknowledge this. So we as surgeons need to carefully look at the available uh, technologies out there. We need to carefully consider costs in anything we do. We've got to constrain the costs, absolutely. Do I believe in some technologies? Of course I do. And we must bring them in, we need to look at them carefully, study which ones actually bring value and which ones don't. And then we must be willing to get rid of the ones that we don't and not allow the hospital administrators to purchase these very expensive playthings that we in our heart of hearts know don't add value. Uh, but that they're kind of fun to play with. And we must be the ones, as surgeons, influencing the people at the table who make these, uh, these decisions. Because ultimately, if we pay a bunch of money for something that comes in, that's going to come to the bottom line, and I can tell you that it'll come back to bite us in the rear end. Can I say that on this panel? In the rear end, um, uh, in terms of other, other things that go on in, in the budget of the healthcare system. So I think we need to be looking for those things that bring value. We need to do the studies that prove that they give value. We need to be very careful about bringing in technologies that don't pass the sniff test uh, when they're bringing them to us to look at, and then be involved in the healthcare decision making when there are five different things with many different costs, and some are greater than others and some are less, and the lesser costing ones give equal uh, or greater value or equal quality, then we have to be the ones at the table saying, yes, let's get the cheaper version that can do the same uh, work that we want to do to get the best care for our patients at the lowest cost. Thank you. So there's no fighting. So 
Uh, all right, so now we're going to see if, uh, if you were persuaded by our expert debaters to have any change in your opinion, if we could have the opinion slide up again. The in favor vote is for those people saying that healthcare technology has become unaffordable. If you go ahead. Unaffordable. unaffordable. So the previous vote was 31 to 8, 79%. Dr. Melvin is ready with his calculator. Oh, he's going to vote. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Vote early in office. <laughs> so looks like we had a sway towards the healthcare technology has become unaffordable. We'll give it one more moment. And it looks like the debate winner is Dr. Soper. <laughs> you were very graciously defeated. Thank you. I thank our second debaters graciously for their presentations, and I will now ask Drs. Fried and Schweitzberg to come up to the podium. While they're doing so, the first thing I would like to do is specifically thank Drs. Fried and Schweitzberg for agreeing to debate with absolutely no preparation on a topic that they had no foreknowledge that they were going to be debating. It's remarkably brave to do that in front of the hundreds of people in this room, so thank you very much. That'll learn you. And now uh, the second thing we need to do is we have established that our debate topic is quality health care requires physician leadership and we have established that Dr. Fried will take the pro side of that debate and Dr. Schweitzberg will take the con side of that debate and we would now like you to vote to give us your pre-debate position. So if you are voting in favor, you are saying that quality health care requires physician leadership and if you are contrary, you are saying we need help or should be asking for more help. The bar is really low for Steve. <laughs> so I think we're going to call the vote right there. So we have 34 in favor and five contrary. 35 and 5 makes it easier for me to do in my head. So given that, I will now ask Dr. Fried to come to the podium and make the argument to try and convince any one of those five people to change their mind. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, Chris. Um, and I, first of all, I, I wonder if the poll, the pre-poll would have been the same if they wouldn't have known who was assigned to each side. Maybe they just gave up on Steve, and, and for that, I thank the audience for their wisdom. Um, you know, when I told people that I was going to have to do this debate unprepared and I was going to have to debate against Steve Schweisberg, people said, how are you ever going to do this? So I had to actually um, think about, you know, how, how I'm like from a third world country, I speak funny, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm debating this guy, he's like a sages president, he's a Harvard professor, I said, like, it's so intimidating, it's so daunting, what am I going to do? They said, just picture him nude in a Buffalo Sabre jersey. And I said, okay, now I'm relaxed, I'm ready to take this on. So I just want the audience to think about that. So what I'm gonna do over the next uh, few minutes is uh, really undress Stephen. Now, first of all, I want to tell you, and I don't think I have to actually say anything, I'd probably win the debate anyways, but all advances in quality require leadership. I think that's a given. And that the second point that I'd like to make is that leadership is earned, it's not uh, anointed. So people, uh, to be a leader, actually have to earn leadership. And I think uh, those are two givens. What is leadership? Leadership is uh, an opportunity to provide order. The opposite of leadership really would be chaos. A leader is responsible to establish a, a vision, help a group of individuals define goals, to influence the participants in the success of that project by aligning them with values, to communicate, to understand what are the barriers to implementing the quality program that you're trying to do, identify individuals among the group to carry the ball, and your job as a leader is to support and enable them, and to take pleasure out of their success, not being a leader to, to try to own their success. 
to identify the resources that are required to implement your uh, program to establish a higher value system and to meet them out, recognizing, as we learned from the previous debate, that resources are limited. And then what, what is quality? And quality, I think, uh, again, as pointed out in the uh, previous debate, requires an understanding of value because you always have to ask yourself, of course everyone wants to improve quality, but what are the goals and at what cost? And that's where leadership is required. I believe a leadership is also responsible to uh, implement measurement because it's very hard to improve something if you can't measure it. And you have to make sure that people actually believe in the metrics that you're going to measure and that they're valid. Those are things that are words that I've used a lot. The question or the value that you're trying to improve, the quality issue, has to be important to people. And it has to be of general enough um, interest that it won't be a bunch of individual people in a non-leadership environment, each looking at a very, very focused area that might be competitive with one another. So you want values that are core values and that are general. And you have to define the perspective of the quality issue that you're trying to improve, whether it be from the patient's perspective, the surgeon's perspective, the institution, the healthcare syst system, et cetera. And then, as I said earlier, you have to define at what cost you're going to do that so that you ensure that the, the incremental improvement in quality is, uh, in, is worth the investment that you're going to make. So in the absence of leadership, what do you get? You get chaos, you get competing interests, you get friction, um, you get a warped sense of values, you get inefficient use of resources, and you get someone who says, I know somebody and therefore I could get the resources for what I'm trying to uh, accomplish. So in closing, Steve, I respect your interest in improving quality. When you start as low as you are, there's lots of room for improvement. And if you can't achieve quality with leadership, then you have to look at a lottery in order to get it. So I welcome um, your point of view, and I look forward to an opportunity to rebut it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Fried, and we will give Dr. Schweitzberg the opportunity to debate the contrary side of this argument. I'd like to thank the former students and residents who voted for my side. Um, and can I have the first slide, please? No, I don't know. Even I can't do that. So, so listen, Jerry, you know, when I thought about debating you, you may have thought of uh, me naked on a beach, but I thought of you in a Canadian mounted police uh, uniform, that the sagest thing, and that was equally horrifying uh, for me. So I'm not arguing that quality doesn't require leadership. I'm arguing that we're probably not the right people to be in charge. Look where it's gotten us. We have been castigated as physicians by the Institute of Medicine as killing millions of patients. We have found ourselves in self-interest uh, practice of medicine where we buy expensive technology because we want to compete in the medical arms race and write papers in the literature saying, listen, I've done it, nobody died, it must be um, okay. We are motivated by our financial incentives that those procedures that get us the most amount of patients that result in the most amount of income motivates many of us in, in practice. And so I contend that we have been in charge and that in many ways we've, as physician leaders, have dropped the ball and quality has suffered as a result. But let's go back to the beginning, Jerry. I, I can't imagine you as a student at McGill wanting to sit there saying, I want to go to med school so I can be a data wonk someday. Uh, Melina, do you think that might be true, I hope. But, uh, you know, we went to med school to take care of patients. We're best in front of the patient. And like all things that you need commitment to, caring for our patients is a full-time avocation. And trying to pretend that we are experts on data is probably not achievable. What do we do when we get the data? How many people in this room know how to calculate a p-value? How many know what a confidence interval is? How many people know how to grade the evidence themselves and read the literature? We need full-time professionals to evaluate the data from the care we provide in order to inform us of what's quality. And worse, we have abrogated our right to decide what's the best because we're motivated by our financial incentives, which we can't seem to, to break from. The measurement of quality 
is important. You cannot improve what you can't measure. And thus, as physicians geared for, designed to care for patients, we're just not the right people for that. I think we should be on the team, but we're so close to the problem, we can't be the ones allowed the final say. If we were to step back and just look at the previous debate, nobody with a rational sense of cost in healthcare would allow a physician to use a robot in laparoscopic cholecystectomy. No one would allow us to do some of the procedures that are completely unproven, even outside of the context of a research paradigm. We're too close to it. We need leadership that is full-time, professional, committed to help us evaluate the care we provide. And thus, yes, leadership requires quality. Unfortunately, we're not the right people, Jerry. Dr. Freed. You have three minutes to correct the record. I'm not going to need that that long. But thank you very much, uh, Chris. I, you know, um, I, I think Steve, you actually made my point. And um, what you showed was uh, the lack of good leadership leads to chaos. Uh, the lack of willingness to uh, acquire the skills to be able to um, take leadership invites uh, politicians and bean counters to define our direction for us and to define what quality means. And if quality uh, just means uh, how much uh, money you spend um, or the type of stuff that comes out in administrative data sets that is not informed by clinical um, expertise, then we're in a very, very uh, bad situation. Uh, working in a um, socialized healthcare system, I've had more than my opportunity to witness what happens when there's lack of uh, physician leadership and the opportunities that are provided when you have a, a clinical leader with the appropriate skills that do understand value, p-values, and what constitutes real excellence. Understanding that surgeons are individuals and individuals with lots of ego, the lack of ability to uh, lead them by example uh, and by excellence uh, is uh, going to lead us along the path for failure. So we need leaders, and we need leaders with the appropriate expertise. And if you want, uh, I'm happy to train you in how to uh, measure a p-value and what constitutes significance. Thank you. Dr. Schweitzberg, your rebuttal. With, with all due respect, Jerry, it's great hubris to think that you can be a great surgeon, a great statistician. Uh, we are great at caring for patients. Yet, at the same time, uh, if we look at where we have gotten, um, it's, it's easy in Canada. There's, listen, come on, there's like hardly anybody there. And so using Canada as the example of, of great leadership, that's like leading a, like a, a Boy Scout troop. I mean, it's just, it's just not that hard, Jerry. But in, in, a, in a big country where there's so many competing interests, where there are many, many uh, diverse incentives and payers, we really need people that are a little more objective and a little bit uh, not quite as close to the heart of the issues, and therefore we, are, we need to engage some help from the outside. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frieds and Dr. Dr. Fried and Dr. Schweitzberg. If I could follow the lead of Dr. Beisky and ask you to join me on the podium. Uh, we, are, we are now going to have a post vote to find out whether Dr. Schweitzberg's runners were able to deliver that stack of $20 bills and whether any of the McGill alumni have left the room. <laughs> the pre-vote debate had 35 in favor of this resolution and 5 against, and if I remember grade 2, I think that's about 88% pro. <clears throat> uh, we are currently looking at a remarkable <laughs> turnaround. <laughs> Clearly the fear factor has influenced the audience. <laughs> I think we're not going to wait too long for this result, and we're going to have to declare this one in favor of Dr. Schweitzberg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. That's great. That's too funny. So once again, I thank our last two debaters in particular for doing this uh, off the cuff. Also, Drs. Melvin and Soper for their debate. Dr. Beisky, thank you for being an excellent co-chair, and this session is concluded. Thank you very much.